My good friend Gigak put out a video Wednesday tackling a subject that's been on my mind a lot this last year. As he put it, the death of classic anime. Anyone who's been watching anime since before the great streaming revolution will tell you that the community used to be a lot more united on the subject of what anime were essential viewing for new fans and what constituted the best of the best. And anyone who's been watching for more than a few weeks can tell you that seasonal shows absolutely dominate the current anime conversation, while older stuff tends to get very little attention. Gigik's video explores how our understanding of classic anime has changed and makes a case for why there's value in experiencing older anime. It's a great watch with a message that I fully endorse, and I'm continuing the conversation that he started here, so if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to click the link in the doobly-doo to do so. But while I do agree with Gigik's overall sentiment, as you can probably tell from the title of this video, I disagree with his core premise, that the classics are dying, or no longer being canonized because the relative high quality of most anime has diminished every other anime's staying power. I believe that classic anime are still making their way into our cultural memory, as they always have, and possibly in greater numbers than ever before. But that memory has become fragmented as the community has grown, and we need to shift our perspective of both new classics and old ones to account for this change. I also have my own thoughts on what makes a classic a classic in the first place, but we'll get to that. In the early 2000s, a few different factors conspired to spark an explosion in anime's Western popularity. Children's TV producers in the late 90s found that licensing Japanese cartoons was a cheap and effective way of filling airtime with relatively high-quality content, which led to many kids being exposed to anime's distinctive style and storytelling sensibilities for the first time. Simultaneously, advances in video rendering and communication technology were making it easier and easier for the enthusiasts who'd loved anime for decades to coordinate with one another, translate new anime, and distribute their work in accessible formats. So when those kids made their way to the World Wide Web, they found a vast array of new fan-translated shows waiting to feed their growing interest. Meanwhile, back in the real world, anime distributors like Funimation and R.I.P. sorry, ADV, used the cash from their TV deals to snap up more and more niche anime licenses and distribute them on DVD for the growing enthusiast market, while also trying to market them to TV channels like Nightblocks. So, uh, so Is this the biggest anime and manga-based convention in the United States? It's gotta be, folks. Hi, everybody. Mike Jarek here with a special edition of Sci-Fi Buzz, this time from Anime Expo 96. Demand for anime grew quickly in tandem with this ballooning supply, and in a short period of time, forums and conventions changed from quiet gatherings of like-minded hardcore enthusiasts to bustling hives of frantic activity. It was out of this culture that our current idea of classic anime emerged. What we must keep in perspective to understand our current situation, though, is that the community was still very small back then relative to its current size, and that it was a lot more homogenous as a direct result of the mechanisms that drove its growth. Fan subbers would largely pick and choose what they wanted to bring over themselves based on their own interests, and as fan subbing is the kind of hobby that mainly attracts huge nerds, their selections tended to lean toward nerd obsessions like sci-fi and fantasy, further filtering the existing geek interests of the animators making the shows in the first place. Those geeks and the geeks who watched their work also formed the core market for legal anime, and so a lot of what ended up being licensed for late night blocks and overpriced home video releases was was catered toward their tastes, which in turn shaped the tastes of everyone who was getting into anime around that time as they drifted toward what was popular and took suggestions from friends. If you were into anime back then, it was all but guaranteed that you enjoyed some combination of swords, sorcery, martial arts, fan service, robots, and space. And if we look back at what the community was holding up as classics and hot must-watch titles in the mid-2000s, it becomes readily apparent just how dominant those specific tastes were. In other words, almost every show and movie that we think of as classic anime is probably closer to a niche cult classic. And to see this, we need only peek outside our community at the wider discourse around mainstream film, where both Akira and Ghost in the Shell are generally considered to be cult classics. Just about the only anime film that has reached true, uncontested mainstream classic status is Spirited Away, which isn't even the best Miyazaki movie, but it's far 
and away the one that the most people have seen and continue to discuss. On the TV side of things, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, and Sailor Moon, as well as Adult Swim mega hits like Cowboy Bebop and Ava, are just about the only shows to ever come near that level of saturation. Everything else that's thought of as a classic in the anime fandom only has that level of status because the anime fandom is the cult or at least it was. The anime community as we understood it then still exists, but it no longer encompasses the anime community as we know it today. The birth of streaming platforms, where almost all shows are equally accessible the moment they air in Japan, has allowed this community to expand exponentially, and in doing so, take in a much more varied audience with varied tastes. Beyond the mecha nerds and shonen bros, now we've got hardcore idol otaku and folk who fawn over serious dramatic works. There are zen slice of life viewers, moe fanboys and sports fangirls, people who spend all day watching one anime girl do her homework to the tune of lo-fi hip hop, comedy junkies, isekai obsessives and etchy loving perverts. There's a lot of overlap between these groups and what people watch, but few people, if any, are into every kind of anime out there. While the anime community as a whole seems to have the cultural memory of a goldfish, within these enclaves of fans, the best shows live long past the end of their seasons. You don't have to look far on the internet to find people still talking and memeing about Yori Moi, Made in Abyss, Haikyuu, Yuri on Ice, High School DxD, or a Gairu, Gridman, Otakoi, Megalobox, HBK Euphonium, Violet Evergarden, Recreators. Some of these shows are more broadly loved than others, but all of them are well on their way to becoming classics in the eyes of at least some anime fans. And some of those groups of fans, despite being very, very, very into anime, are going to look at stuff like FMA or Lane or Gits or Gurren, and they're just not gonna care because it's not their thing. There are a lot of reasons that modern anime fans aren't going back to check out the mandatory classics like they used to. Part of it is that the algorithmically driven model of content binging that defines the streaming era tends to push us toward what's new and shiny. Part of it is that there's so much great new stuff coming out all the time that there's rarely any need to seek out older stuff to fill the gaps. But a big part of it is also that not everybody is interested in what those classic shows have to offer. And that's a reality we've just gotta live with as anime inches closer and closer to mainstream popularity. Shows that would have been on every anime fan's lips had they come out in the early 2000s like Recreators and Kekai Sensen are going to be more obscure relatively speaking, because the people who would be talking about them are only part of the community. And some classics from that time are going to fall into obscurity as well. That's not to say that it's impossible for new anime to reach the saturation threshold required to be recognized as classics in the broader community, just that they probably won't look much like the classics of yore. In the last decade, Attack on Titan, One Punch Man, Your Name, My Hero Academia, and Sword Art Online almost certainly passed it. A lot of hardcore weebs will turn their noses up at those shows, but they're what people will bring up when they talk about anime in the coming decades. Because every one of them, even that one, is a vital touchstone for anyone who wants to fully understand what was going on in the anime industry and anime community over the last few years. Without looking back at those anime, it will be impossible to form a complete picture of this time period. For what it's worth, all of those shows also had English dubs that aired on Toonami and that were widely viewed on Netflix and Hulu, while Your Name had a wide theatrical release. Those factors really helped them penetrate popular culture. Availability makes a massive difference in what people even see, let alone talk about. Landing on a poorly managed platform like Amazon Prime can kill a great show, while a good one can be massively elevated with a wide release and the right marketing push. Just as an example, in a world where ReZero received a timely English dub that could have aired on Toonami, I can see it being as big as any of the shows I just named, and finding its own place in the long-term discourse alongside them. And I'm willing to bet that most of you can envision that same scenario. Nothing that I've just said is meant to downplay the importance of the countless cult classics old and new that are celebrated within the anime fandom. Far from it, I would love it if more of these shows were recognized for what they've managed to achieve with their target audiences. My intent is only to provide a bit of perspective for both new anime fans who weren't there and wonder what us old fogies are banging on about all the time, and older fans who felt this change in the discourse and might be misattributing the cause. 
Hopefully this is going to help us communicate a little better about the classics. To be sure, what I've said doesn't fully encapsulate the scope of this issue. I haven't even touched on how the technological breakdown of language barriers has changed the shape of this community, and I can't speak to the experiences or cultural touchstones of folk in other countries. And all that we've discussed so far is kind of predicated on the notion that anime needs to leave a measurable, lasting impact or be widely celebrated and remembered to be a classic, which I don't believe is always the case. To me, a classic work of art is one that's still worth experiencing and discussing outside the time for which it was made, and that is as worthy of your attention as more modern works that might be competing for it, if not more so. That's what I believe it means to truly stand the test of time, and there are many ways that an anime can get there. But broadly speaking, I believe there are three categories of classics. Firstly, a classic can be a work of art whose influence is still felt in comparable artwork made long after its release. In this case, experiencing it can be instructional in better understanding those later works or the genres that they comprise. Good examples of this in anime would be shows like Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z, which aren't necessarily amazing and may even be pretty bad in places, but that are vital to understanding Magical Girl and Shonen and battle anime, respectively. Sword Art Online arguably serves the same role for modern isekai. A show that exemplifies the best traits of a genre or style can also be worth watching for similar reasons. As far as shonen battle stuff goes, I'd say FMA, Hunter x Hunter, and My Hero all fit that bill, as does ReZero for isekai. Secondly, a classic can be a work of art whose unique ideas and imagery have permeated the cultural zeitgeist and that is still remembered and widely discussed years after its release. Experiencing these works can help you better understand other works that reference them, as well as the culture at the time they came out. Initial D is one such eternal touchstone, Ava and Akira are near constant points of reference, and I believe that as time goes on, Your Name and Attack on Titan will enjoy similar referential ubiquity. Lastly, a classic can be a work of art so refined that its quality does not diminish, or better yet, grows with time. Or, in the absence of that timeless polish, a work that puts forward new ideas that remain relevant for decades to come. Serial Experiments Lane and Paranoia Agent are two such shows. Their presentation remains compelling to this day, and as the internet becomes more ubiquitous in our lives, their messages only grow more relevant. Cowboy Bebop, meanwhile, is a great example of a show that holds up by virtue of its presentation quality alone. And there are less celebrated shows that hold up just as well, like Irresponsible Captain Tyler, Now and Then, Here and There, and Vision of Escaflone, Fuck You, Fight Me, Gart. Sorry, I promised myself this wouldn't be confrontational. Among more modern shows, I'd say One Punch Man, Season 1, Mob Psycho 100, Yori Moi, and Violet Evergarden are among the strongest contenders for this kind of classical longevity. These categories can, and often do, overlap, obviously. If a show is really good and really popular, there's a good chance that it can be immensely influential as well, but they don't have to overlap. I brought up classics that aren't that good and don't really hold up too well on their own, but still left an impact and are widely loved. And there are INCREDIBLE shows that don't manage either. Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju is easily one of the greatest anime dramas ever made, regardless of the fact that few people watched it. And no matter how much time passes, even if not a single new person checks it out or talks about it, that will still be true. Its writing, acting, sound design, direction, and animation are timeless in their quality. Its ideas are eternally relevant, and it will still be as watchable in half a century as it is now, even if it does look a bit pixelated on our 64K Super Saiyan God HD displays. To call it anything less than an instant classic feels dishonest to me, and I'm sure that there are countless works out there of similar quality that I'm not aware of because most people aren't. Now, perhaps it feels dishonest to me because I'm running into the limitations of the words that are available to describe the historical and cultural importance of these works. I may have made this whole rambling video because the word classic isn't really sufficient to encompass the way we now experience, create, and discuss art. I really don't know. This issue is way too big for one video or even one person to tackle, because while I'm using anime as a focal point, this is just a sliver of a much broader philosophical conversation that we need to be having about how we consume and process art. 
And the questions and answers in that conversation are changing at light speed as technological advancements rewrite our rules of communication on a regular basis. As many of you were quick to point out when I released my video about recreators two years ago, oh god, it's been two years, I still need to make that philosophy video, the question of what a classic even is is a lot bigger than any one person's opinions and any one moment in time. Yet, I can only discuss this from my own perspective here and now. To counterbalance that limitation, I'd love to see you guys, well, doing what I've just done, carrying on the discussion in the comments, on forums and social media, and in your own video responses. In doing so, I think we can all come to a better understanding of the anime we love and the history behind it, and if we're lucky, the discourse might push a few more weebs to give the classics, both recent and ancient, a shot. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement. <laughs>